Hi, this is Elias Nikolakopoulos and Manos Brilakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute and the Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation, presenting case 83 for the Manual of Percutaneous Coronary Intervention. This is a case in which multiple challenges had to be overcome in a multivessel PCI. The patient had presented with non stemming was found to have left main and three vessel disease and was referred for coronary bypass, however, he declined and he was referred to our institution for PCI. We decided to use radial access, but we had uh, a lot of difficulty advancing a J-tipped guide wire through the radial artery. In cases like this, the first thing to do is to not push, but instead make sure there's a good waveform, and then get the catheter proximal to that area of resistance and perform an angiogram to understand what the problem is. And that's exactly what we did in our case. The angiogram showed what we already knew from the ultrasound, that the radial artery caliber was fairly small and hence the resistance. We used a glide wire that uh, went up and we were able to go all the way to the aorta. However, the patient did develop significant radial spasm, even using five, five French catheters, and therefore we decided to switch femoral. some challenges with the wire going into the left subclavian, but eventually delivered um, the same uh, five friends JR4 guide we had from the radial axis. And here is the target lesion of the right coronary artery, which is a distal right coronary lesion. The lesion was predilated, some improvement, not much. And then uh, we tried to deliver a stent However, as you can see, the stent uh, cannot be delivered, the guide is being pushed back, which we kind of expected given um, uh, the tortuosity, but then the way to overcome this and the advantage of having a five friends is uh, to actually clock the five friends and deep seat it into the vessel, essentially doing the work of a guide liner. So these are the options for improving delivery. The first one is to improve support of the guide catheter, and one of the ways to do that is by deep intubation of the catheter. The other is by using, using a guide extension, however, that's not feasible with the five friends guide, or using various anchoring techniques. So having the guide um, turn clockwise, it was a little challenging, but eventually it did go further down, and then we were able to deliver the stent across the target lesion. Because the lesion was still tight, we couldn't really visualize distally. However, we did have our landmarks from before, and we knew where to place the stand. And the stand did nail the lesion in the middle. However, unfortunately, there was not much expansion of the lesion. It remained uh, um, unexpanded at 12 atmospheres, and we didn't want to really go high pressure with the stand balloon to avoid any dissections distally. And this is the first. Uh, step in a balloon and dilatable lesion, which is to get a high pressure balloon, non-compliant balloon, and inflate it. And this is exactly what we did here. We had to get the guide even further down, but eventually we were able to deliver a non-compliant balloon all the way inside the stent. And by going 20 atmospheres, the stent nicely expanded. So a nice result on the right coronary artery. And then we switched uh, to the left. We had the similar issues with the guide, with the wire going into the subclavian. But eventually, uh, we were able to engage. And this is the image of the LAD. The patient did have multiple high-grade lesions, near occlusive lesion in the mid LAD, and also a severe lesion in the proximal LAD. There's also left main disease that cannot be seen in this projection and proximal circumflex. The guide wire did enter several branches. And one way to overcome this is to allow the guide wire to prolapse like this, which then prevents it from getting into more of those small branches. The lesion was predilated, and then ultrasound, intravascular ultrasound was performed uh, that demonstrated diffuse disease. There was some calcification, but it was non-circumferential, again, extensive amount of plaque. And here is uh, some calcium in the more proximal segment of the LAD, but it is uh, 180 degrees. And then moving closer to the left main, 
there was actually significant disease in the um, distal left main before the origin of the LAD. So we placed the stent into the middle AD. However, there was still no flow undergrade, making it very hard to know if we really positioned the stent well. And the way to overcome this, we pulled the stent back, we injected, and then advanced the stent afterwards. And now we do have the contrast being retained, and we know exactly where to place our stent. Stent was deployed, low pressure as in the right coronary artery. And then we did the picture. Still, the flow is not the best, but there is also a high-grade lesion in the proximal. We used the balloon of the initial stent, which was 38 millimeters in diameter, to assess how long the other stents should be. And then perform post-dilatation of the uh, middle AD stent. One technique that can help with visualizing the position of the balloon is the clear stent. That's with the Siemens. There's also the stand boost with Philips that can really blow up and magnify the location of the balloon to ensure that the post dilation happens inside the stand and we don't have the balloon protruding out, potentially injuring the vessel more distally and predisposing for stenosis and or dissection. We then placed uh, a stand in the proximal LAD. Once again, we did not have um, good visualization because the contrast would not go through. However, we knew from prior that this would cover the lesion in terms of stand length. And we deployed the stand once again using clear stand. We made sure we post dilated. And we did get a nice result with Timothy flow into the LAD. The question is now is how to treat uh, the proximal circumflex that had a hazy lesion as well as uh, the distal left main. And this is another view. Once again, there is a proximal circumflex lesion, there is a distal left main lesion, and there is a left main trifurcation with an LAD, Ramus branch, and the circumflex. We did uh, wire the Ramus as well, because that was an important branch, and there was a possibility of feed getting compromised during attempts to put stents. And we decided uh, to first treat the circumflex, so we did place uh, a stand into the proximal circumflex lesion. And the question here is what to do next. The first question is, uh, does the side branch, which is the circumflex in our case, need to be preserved? And then what is the likelihood of occlusion? And we thought that the circumflex had some disease, but uh, the likelihood of losing it was low as it was low for the Ramos branch. Therefore, we decided to treat the distal left main using provisional stenting, stenting from the left main all the way into the LAD. That was a 3.5 stent, uh, confirmed in multiple projections, and deployed. And that provided uh, Okay, result in the lady. The circumflex still looks there is some lesion more proximally, and clearly the distal uh, left main needs uh, post dilation. The stand is uh, uh, undersized. And that's why, before doing anything else, the first step now is to do the proximal optimization technique. This is a nice illustration about why this is important. If the stand is not fully opposed to the wall, then when we try to rewire, then the wire may actually go outside the stand that we placed. And then if that's the case, when we do the balloon inflation, then it can really crush the previously placed stand. The other key factor when doing bifurcation standing is to make sure that the stand that we use can be expanded to match the diameter of the proximal vessel. In this case, we did have a 3.5 Zion stand, which we know can go all the way up to 5.5. And the left main was about a 4.0 vessel, so we knew that we could expand it as much as needed. So we did a proximal optimization technique with a 8 mm 4.0 stand. Again, there is improvement uh, in the left main, but there is also some disease into the proximal circumflex, whereas the ostium of the ramus is not well visualized. So the question now is, are we done, or should we take care of that proximal circumflex uh, lesion? We did uh, once again intravascular ultrasound to check the stent into the LAD and the left main. Uh, 
His, here is the aorta, and as we're going in, we see that the stent is actually protruding slightly into the aorta, so we do have uh, osteal coverage. And then uh, uh, the left main stent appears to be well expanded. But to ensure that the ramus and uh, the circumflex were okay, we used uh, a pressure wire. This is the options pressure wire. And um, after equalization, we did place it both in the ramus, in which the DPR, which is the IFR equivalent, was 0 0.98, so no significant disease there. And then we did have uh, quite some difficulty advancing it uh, into the circumflex, but eventually, after uh, some manipulation, we were able to advance it. And the DPR was 0 0.91, with 0 0.89 being the cutoff. So we decided to actually not do additional treatment of the proximal circumflex. This uh, was supposed to be the final picture. However, here we may start noticing there's maybe something into the LED stand. And this is the cranial picture. Now we do see actually a filling defect within the stand we placed in the proximal to mid LED just a few minutes ago. This is an acute stent thrombosis event. We did check RCT, which was uh, 280. It was therapeutic. The patient did have uh, loading with clopidogrel. However, that was done at the beginning of the case. So most likely the reason for the acute stent thrombosis here is that the patient uh, he had not been pretreated long enough with a P2Y12 inhibitor to have uh, uh, enough levels to prevent uh, stent thrombosis. But now we have a situation because we do have a stent protruding in the left main, and we did have a lot of difficulty advancing a guide wire. Uh, eventually, after multiple attempts and looping the wire, we were able to get through, but then the balloons would not cross. And the assumption here is that we have gone through or under the struts of the left main. How to overcome this? One way is to form a hairpin or a knuckle at the wire using the so-called reverse guide wire or hairpin technique. Polymer jacketed wire, three centimeters or so are protruding from the introducer, bent at 180 degrees. And then what we're putting into the TUI is actually the dilator with the wire protruding, the loop going forward. And this is actually the knuckled wire going straight from the left main into the LED. After doing that, uh, we were able to actually advance uh, balloons and uh, performed intravascular ultrasound once again to understand better what was going on in the stand of the LED. And what we found there is a filling defect. There's a filling defect in the LED which uh, almost certainly represents thrombus. And again, it's another picture of the filling defect in the middle LED. So this is again an episode of acute stent thrombosis, presumably because of uh, a suboptimal P2Y, P2Y12 uh, platelet inhibition, because the stent actually otherwise seemed to be well expanded. What to do next? Uh, we decided to do thrombectomy. Uh, you see, we still had some difficulty advancing the thrombectomy catheter, this is the penumbra catheter, but eventually it was advanced. It went to the middle AD, and then we actually did retrieve uh, the thrombus. And that resulted in a resolution of the LAD filling defect. Uh, we did another ultrasound to assess the LAD, but then uh, we noticed that uh, the LAD looked okay. But as uh, we were coming back into the left main and the left main ostium, there is a problem. So our catheter, it's outside the left main stand, which has been crumbled. So most likely what happened here is that when we tried to reassess, to re-enter into the left main, the wire went under the previously placed left main stand. And then with the equipment going through, the left main stand got crumbled. Obviously, we, want to we didn't want to leave that untreated, so we had to place another stand. This is an 8 mm 40 stand uh, deployed uh, at the ostium of the left main, making sure we don't compromise the distal bifurcation. That was flared. And then to make sure that we had as good a position to the ostium of the vessel as possible, we did use the osteal flush balloon, which is specifically designed for this purpose has a balloon that is 8 millimeters and is inflated at normal pressure 
and then a more proximal balloon inflate a load pressure that is very big. And what this does is it pushes the struts of the stand against the wall, potentially facilitating re-engagement should it be needed in the future. After doing that, uh, we uh, repeated IVUS, and this time there was a good result with um, the stent, the left main stent protruding all the way into the aorta. We can see here the flow in the aorta. The left main stent is expanded uh, one, two, three, four, essentially five um, millimeters, and going all the way into the aorta. And this was the final result, showing good flow into the LAD and the circumflex, and the patient did have an uneventful recovery. In summary, there are many challenges that had to be overcome in this case, starting with uh, challenges with access. If there is a small radial artery, switching to something else, ulnar or femoral in our case, uh, is the way to go to prevent problems down the line. Second, uh, this uh, in the right coronary artery, we had difficulty delivering, but using deep uh, intubation of the guide, it was a five friend, so went all the way down to the distal RCA, that enabled delivery of the stents. Third, the clear stent can help uh, with postillation of the stents to ensure that the balloon stays inside the stents. Fourth, in cases of provisional standing, if there is any question regarding the branches and whether there is more stenting needed, then using the pressure wire into the jailed vessel can help determine if it is uh, significantly compromised or not. Fifth, there is um, the risk of acute stent thrombosis in non-pretreated patients undergoing PCI, especially complex PCI in this case. We did give to B3 in the patient after stent thrombosis, but potentially having given it up front might have helped uh, prevent stent thrombosis. Sixth, we had to rewire through the left main stent that caused uh, longitudinal deformation and crumbling. And uh, using a knuckle can help prevent that, but if uh, it occurs, then another stent is needed. And finally, the Osteal Pro can help flare osteal, aorto-osteal stents to facilitate uh, re-engagement and rewiring should it be needed in the future. Thank you.